The first time I became aware of the Yumo case was in 1975, 45 years ago. At that time, Maurice Vuitton, an astronomer belonging to the Space Astronomy Laboratory in Marseille, had sent me a few dozen pages extracted from one of the letters received in Spain. These pages corresponded to a vast set of documents received by Spaniards from the mid-sixties. They were assigned by people who pretended to come from another planet they called Yumo. At the time, I was a member of the Observatory of Marseille, and I worked as an astrophysicist. Antonio Ribera had communicated these documents to an engineer of the Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales, Claude Poer, who forwarded a copy to Maurice Vuitton. We have had these pages translated into French. They referred to information devoted to the navies described in these Yumo documents. They described a system that allows passengers to withstand acceleration up to 50 g. A liquid contained in this orange part could be transferred into a toroidal passenger compartment. And though it with tixotropic properties, it could very quickly pass from the liquid state to the solid state under the effect of an electric field. Acceleration pulses were then applied when the substance was in a solid state. Other former engineers from the École Nationale Supérieure de l'Aéronautique de Paris, I knew that human beings could more easily withstand acceleration impulses rather than a continuous acceleration. I found the process logical and interesting. There was another information about the material of which the navies were made, which today we would call intelligent material. Indeed, the structure of the navies was traversed by fine canals filled with the same liquid which could just pass very quickly from the liquid state to the solid state, thus modifying the local mechanical properties. In particular, this was opposed to a possible resonance response of the structure. This aspect seemed to me to be the logical extension of our aeronautical technology with the aim of making future aircraft lighter. I was therefore intrigued by the quality of the technical information contained in these documents and wanted to know more. I then contacted Antonio Ribera, who provided us with new reports representing hundreds of pages. I then discovered the vastness of the themes covered. As an astrophysicist, my attention was immediately drawn to what referred to the structure of the cosmos. Antonio Ribera gave us a copy of Sesma's book, Humo Otro Planeta Habitado which we immediately translated into French. In this set, I discovered several ideas long before I became aware of the article published in 1967 by the Russian Andrei Sakharov, which were not translated into English and French until the early 80s. In the mid-70s, I was already familiar with the so-called Newtonian cosmology, which I approached through solution of the Vlasov equation, representing a description of the universe in a non-relativistic seven-dimensional space. Thanks to this original approach, I had already published many articles allowing to find Friedman's models, as well as gravitational instability and elements of galactic dynamics. 
So I tried to convert uh, the idea of these humo documents into a new representation of the universe, a model with two twin enantiomorphic universes which are equipped with two opposite arrows of time. I then considered two interacting populations described by two Vlasov equations coupled by the Poisson equation. The first model of twin universe, non-relativistic, then appeared. This work was the subject of two publications of the Academy of Science of Paris in 1977. Then I had the impression of assembling the first pieces of a vast puzzle. The mathematical pieces fitted so well that I concluded that the creator of the puzzle, ahead of the today's science, must have known the general design. In 2014, 37 years later, I was able to build the relativistic version of this model through a publication in the journal Astrophysics and Space Science. By the way, this model explained mathematically the acceleration of the cosmic expansion. By the end of the 70s, my contact with UMO network had expanded to include Raphael Fayons and other contacts such as Ilfred Franz. In the middle of the 80s, I tried to exploit this totally original idea, according to which cosmic evolution would have occurred with variable speed of light. At that time, there were no articles suggesting this kind of phenomenon. The Yomo text simply said that this speed was higher in the past. I have therefore tried to describe this evolution by imagining that this speed c would vary like the inverse of air space scale factor of the universe. But this attempt did not give me any interesting result. Then I took part in a meeting in Madrid with various contacts, including Iltrus France, Jordan Peña, Dominguez, and of course Files. At that time, they had telephone calls with units by night. During such exchanges, the Spaniards could ask questions and get quick, precise answer. When I mentioned that, Dominguez said, I asked them. It's not C divided by R, but C on the square root of R. I took note of this information. I then asked him if he had obtained any other information during his phone calls. And he said, I have asked them what black holes are. And they said, black holes do not exist. When a neutron star is destabilized, when it gets more mass and when it overcomes its limit of stability, it gets rid of it by sending this mass in the tuned universe. I was extremely puzzled by this sentence, and I am still puzzled today. In effect, it questioned object whose existence had never been questioned by scientists, also they have not really been observed a sentence that gave rise of a lot of work for me over the decades that followed. As soon as I returned to France, this information about the evolution of the speed of light became a decisive element. Moreover, it was the only one to take account not only of the variation speed of light, but joint variation of all constants of physics, ensuring the invariance of all the equations of physics. Thus, my work was freed from the difficulty that other authors were encountering. This was, was the subject of a new publication in a high-level journal, Modern Physics Letter A. It is interesting to note that this work provided the justification for the extreme homogeneity of the primitive universe, which was not observed until a year later, when the Kobe satellite was put into orbit. The theory of inflation by the Russian Linde is based on the hypothesis of the existence of hypothetical particles 
the inflatons, which are supposed to be transformed into a matter-antimatter set according to an undescribed process. My interpretation went completely unnoticed, mainly because I was never able to present this theory in international meetings due to the lack of funding. Back to this idea of the twin structure of the universe, the things became clearer when I was able to understand through the work of the French mathematician Jean-Marie Suriau, died in 2012, the physical meaning of the inversion of the time coordinate. According to his work of 1970, based on his theory of dynamical groups, this inversion of the time coordinate just means the inversion of the energy and the mass. This greatly accelerated the work of developing a cosmological model to which I have given the name of Janus, this ancient god looking both to future and past. The ins and outs of this model can be found in a long video now dubbed in Spanish and English. I will not refer any longer to the scientific work that has been published in high-level scientific journals, which I believe would never have come to light without this set of informations from the document and from the group of the people in connection with the Humo case. I will now move on anecdotal aspects. Very soon, learning that Raphael Fires and other at telephone contact with the authors of the document, I asked to meet them. Farias forwarded my request, which was accepted. So I was asked to come at the Hotel saint V on a specific date. This is the room plan. This is the access corridor. This is bathroom. This is a bed occupied by my translator Jean-Jacques Pasteur. Next to it, the bed I used to occupy. I was awakened by the noise made by people busy picking the door. I was conscious but unable to make any slightest movement. Things then moved very quickly. The door opened, men came in. They sat me on my bed and held my face in front of a large projector emitting a blue light. I remember that color very well. Then I fell into unconsciousness, but I regained consciousness with a feeling of extreme cold on the back of my neck. I could see right in front of me a man holding a device in his hands. I remember him very well. He looked to be 50 years old, he was a perfect look-alike of the German actor Kurt Jürgens. When he saw that I was waking up, he waved a sign to a guy who was supposed to be next to me, and I fell into a consciousness again. When I woke up, I felt a burning sensation in my penis, which indicated that I had been intubated, presumably to perform a sperm collection. It would take too much time to mention different incidents of this kind, which occurred in the following years. To me, they have only an anecdotal aspect. I will just mention two more. The first occurred in my home in Pertuis during the 80s. It probably corresponded to an implant placement in the belly, 8 cm to the right of my belly button. This operation left a scar, both superficial and deep, which is still visible today, 40 years later. Another event took place during a visit to Raphael Farials in 1990. One night, Paralyzed, lying face down on my bed, surrounded by the blue light, I apparently had an encephalic implant placed. I could only see the feet of the guy, which were no more than 10 centimeters long. 
It reminds me other events which occurred in my childhood in July 1947, I was 10 years old, and in my adolescence, corresponding to visits of short grays. I will not go into more details on these anecdotal events, similar to many events experienced by contacted and abducted people. At the beginning of 1991, during a visit to Raphael Farrier's home, he showed me a humor letter containing negative comments on the various works published on the humor case. This letter ends with a sentence, three Frenchmen are about to publish a new book which will be worse than all the previous ones. I immediately thought of a visit of the French journalist Martin Castello a few months earlier. She was investigating the humor affair with a view of publishing an article in a popular newspaper. I had been relatively discreet during her visit. Through this letter from Umo, I discovered that she was about to publish a book on the subject, so I phoned her and told her that I was aware of the project. She was extremely surprised because together with another journalist, Isabelle Blanc and Philippe Chambon, she was indeed about to publish this book with Robert Laffont editions. But she told me they had all observed the greatest secrecy about this project. She was tuned when I told her we had heard about this book project through a letter from Yumo. Anyway, I decided to publish my own book on the subject. When the book was in bookstores, I immediately received in September 1991 the first letter signed Yumo which can be found, like all the letters I received afterwards, in the website dedicated to the humor documents, French or Spanish. At that time, I owned a Macintosh microcomputer with a 20 mega hard drive. In it was a text file where I wrote down my scientific thought. Of course, this computer was not connected to anything. The Yumo text have always insisted that all our science remained attached to Aristotle's divinant logic. The mathematician Kurt Gödel has shown the impossibility of creating a language free from undecidable propositions. I mean sentences that escape classification as true or false. For this, he started from the simplest possible language, I mean arithmetic, as defined by the actions proposed in 1895 by the Italian mathematician Piano. The Humo text recommended the transition to tetravalent logic. I then so it could emerge from Gaussian numbers arithmetic, which contains ordinary integer arithmetic. While the so-called integers evoke equidistant points on a straight line, Gauss integers or complex integers evoke nodes in a square mesh. As we can see, Gaussian complex integers are something more general than the set of real integers. I realized that no one had created the axiomatic of Gaussian integers. So I write it down in a kind of diary that I kept in my hard drive. A week later, I received a Yumo letter mailed from the city of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. They strongly encouraged me to develop this idea by offering to help me. Beyond that, they were planning a physical meeting later. They said that Juan Don Peña had been their main contact in Spain, and then I could talk to him and Rafael Farrells about that in complete confidence. Following this advice, I tried to contact Rafael first. As he was slow to reply, I sent him a copy of the letter, thinking that he had been informed about the project. It will never be known what would have happened if instead of contacting him first, 
I had tried to contact Peña. The result was catastrophic. Farios made copies of the letter and distributed them to the member of the group. Among them, Iltrude France, nicknamed Lou, told me on the phone that she had been very interested in the letter. The rest was predictable. This glaring error caused the immediate, total and definitive implosion of the UMU network in Spain. It is extremely easy to conduct disinformation operation in the ufological world because in general the adhesion of these people is based on beliefs, not on an intellectual position. Peña completed the disinformation by saying that he was the author of the UMU letters. That was perfectly absurd. But the ufological world jumped immediately to this conclusion, which allowed to get rid of this cumbersome file. A few years earlier, such an operation had easily convinced Dominguez that the letters UMO had been created by the Indian sect. A few weeks after this spectacular statement by Jordan Peña, I was at Farrell's home. He called Peña on the phone and put on the loudspeaker. I then clearly heard Peña say to Farrell's, Don't shoot, Rafael. It was the Yumits who told me to say that. Today I will be perfectly clear. If such a proposal of contact and meeting were to be made to me again, even if a letter were to designate trustworthy men, I can affirm that I would not speak about this to anyone, just waiting for this contact to materialize. I was personally insensitive to such disinformation operations, since my conviction had scientific basis. After the destruction of the Madrid network, it remained to complete the destruction of the Barcelona network, of which fires was the center of gravity. This was done in a rather cruel way. A letter asked Farrells if he agreed to rebuild the Spanish network. If so, he was asked to contact all the former members of the network by telephone so that the unit could record their emotional response. He did so. There followed a complete silence during years until his death which plunged Raphael into an understable despair. I remember that on a visit in France, he said to me, there are sons of bitch. Today, what about this Yumo case? This story has worked in accordance with the goal formulated by its authors as presented in the first report. It was first and foremost a psychosociological experiment. Exotic ID and exotic concepts had been distributed as pieces of a puzzle. But the author of these reports had calculated that the probability that this element would result in the real transfer of science and technology was extremely low. In this sense, the contents of the two websites, Homo Science and Homo Sciences, just confirm this calculation. I may have been the unsuspected grain of sand in that machine, but you don't have to read documents composed by alien visitors to understand why this scientific and technical transfer are systematically avoided. In all countries, since the UFO phenomenon has emerged, the one and only wish of the government has been to be able to capture bits of science in order to convert them into weapons. Have the mentalities of the men on the earth evolved? The answer is definitely negative on all levels. At the time I am creating this video, it's 2.20. I am 83 years old. Since my first contact in 1975 with these UMO documents, which powerfully sharpened my interest into the UFO subject, I have worked during 45 years to rebuild the cosmological model, taking account the information provided. In 1967, the Russian Andrei Sakharov was the first man who strangely oriented himself toward this image 
of two twin universes with opposite time arrows. You may know that he was a designer of the Russian hydrogen bomb and later of the most dreadful weapon that men ever tested, the terrible Tsar Bomba. Surprisingly, a few years after the Yumo documents began to be distributed, he suddenly decided to abandon all research oriented toward military goals. He then devoted himself to cosmology, making clear at the end of his Nobel Peace Prize speech his obvious interest in extraterrestrial life. Here is the corresponding passage at the end of his speech. Several civilizations could exist in infinite space, including society that might be wiser and more successful than our own. I support the cosmological hypothesis that the development of the universe repeats itself an infinite number of times according to essential characteristics. Other civilizations, including some of the more efficient ones, are inscribed an infinite number of times on the next or previous pages of the book of the universe. Nevertheless, we should not minimize our sacred force in this world. We are like dim lights in the darkness who have emerged for a moment from the nothingness of obscure unconsciousness to material existence. We must respect the demands of reason and create a life that is worthy of ourselves and of the goal we barely perceive. During the 80s, thanks to the help of one of my friends, the great mathematician Jean-Marie Suriot, it was understood that this inversion of time coordinate actually corresponded to the inversion of the mass and energy. With the help of another great mathematician, also of international stature, my late friend Alexandre Grotendieck, it became possible to build the geometrical framework that corresponded to this new model of the universe. During the 90s, I received at my home in Aix-en-Provence a series of letters signed Umo, composed on a computer. The first letter was preceded by a page paying tribute to the contribution of Andrei Sakharov and did not contain any scientific information. With a view to receiving other letters, I decided to use this first page as an element allowing me to verify that other letters would come from the same source, whatever this source could be. To do so, I immediately burned this page, and indeed, the successive letters were preceded by the same page serving as a marker, which I also burned each time. The copies of these letters are available on the websites already mentioned and also on my website at this address. The question of the authenticity or non-authenticity of the documents has never been a matter of concern of mine. What matters to me is whether a document contains a scientific information that I can use. It is often a simple sentence or a simple word that represents a piece of the puzzle. So, for decades, I've been manipulating these puzzle pieces, trying to continue building a model that is both rich and complex. Why the members of the Yumo Science Validation Group were analyzing fonts, spelling mistakes, and the look of ideograms composing signatures. I continue to believe that focusing on scientific input is the smartest way to approach such material. Of course, if you have the right glasses to see these things, Otherwise, we run the risk of giving credit to letters cleverly composed in accordance with a kind of humor culture, but which are in fact fakes and which today are fairly easy to make. The French UFO science group thus considered as authentic a letter from Canada, which contained humor words, 
to which a group had immediately attributed the meaning in accordance with the content of the document. The author of the letter, a young Canadian, confessed to having tested credibility of the group of experts. With regard to the word UMIT, he said he had simply used the name of the product with which he greased his bicycle. Let's go back to those letters from the 90s. You will remember that I received this letter from Saudi Arabia in response to a text I had written on my computer's hard drive. When I received a new letter in which the author described their agenda concerning contact with the earth, I immediately wrote in my diary that this one, pointing to 2050, seemed to me to be completely naive and unrealistic. Never in such a short period of time, counting on simple demonstration by a greater number of overflight, could extraterrestrials hope to see a change in the mentality of the Earthling? I suggested that could be brought about by injecting into the scientific world elements that would eventually lead to the feasibility of interstellar travels. I then received letters fairly quickly that were replies to the messages I placed on my computer's hard drive. It was, of course, an original way of communicating, but it worked quite well, and I stopped wondering how these people, who could be thousands of miles away, could find out what I was putting in my computer. At the time, of course, my computer had no system of connection with the outside world. Here you have a document that refers to the visitors' names. Here, in this type of spacecraft, we find the toroidal cabin, which, when rotated, creates artificial gravity during travel. Two, to avoid the inconvenience caused by the weightlessness on the body and the skeleton. But in fact, this is only a secondary function of this device. When the nave reverses its mass, it has to create a very powerful magnetic field. This cannot be done with a solenoid system because the field will not be uniform in the vicinity of the wires. The solution is to electrically charge the outer wall of the nave and then to set it in very fast rotation. This rotation is achieved by transforming the gas contained in the ring-shaped chamber into a plasma and then rotating it very quickly. The nave is then rotated in the opposite direction. This creates the desired magnetic field. But the passengers wouldn't stand for something like that. The toroidal chamber then disengages before the rest of the craft is rotated. You may have noticed that this letter was sent to five people. After receiving a certain number of letters, I suddenly received another one sent by a man who introduced himself as a secretary of a French contact group. He said that he was writing this letter under the dictation of the people of this Humo network. He added he hoped to be allowed to contact me soon. His letter had been mailed from the city of Caen, in the northern part of France. But it was not acted upon. I'm not going to get into all that technical stuff. In the same way, I will not be able to describe in this short video the geometrical and mathematical modification which constitute the Janus model allowing interstellar travel. It is impossible to summarize in this video 45 years of work. For the Janus model, you will find a presentation summarized in 1 hour and 40 minutes video in several languages the addresses of which you will find on this page. The years have passed. There have been other contacts in different forms. 
do not think that I believe unreservedly to everything that is presented in these documents. It would be an unscientific attitude. Anything must be considered. For example, the fact that when I visited Fario's home in 1990, the feet of the guy who was next to my bed was 10 centimeters long, or that I was visited by short grays in 1947. All that shows that this case is much more complicated. What matters is what emerges from these letters and the various manifestations, whatever the forms of communication adopted. In any case, expeditionaries or groups of expeditionaries have manifested themselves in different ways. The text sent by the Yumo network constitute material that can be worked on by simple text analysis without to consider everything in them as authentic. What we can decipher from these texts is that intelligent beings, let's call them humanoids, living on distant planets, would have evolutionary patterns, social structures, and sex patterns completely different from ours. In any case, the most important is the catastrophic situation in which our planet finds itself. The situation is simply getting worse and worse every year. The first letters sent by this Yumo network have made us understand the cause of the insoluble problems in which people of the Earth are struggling. In the ancient past, an object the size of Mars Probably the debris of a supernova collided with Earth. This collision created the metal core of our planet. But the object also brought kinetic energy, which was converted into heat, restarting the magnetic activity. The giant planets at the end of the solar system, which managed to capture such objects, have not been able to play the role as boundary gardens. Without this event, the geography of our planet would be very different. With a unique flat continent, the Earth's magma would then be calm, so there would be no volcanism. There would be only one continent, free of land forms. The maximum altitude of broad hills would not exceed 300 meters. This continent would represent a single biotope free of natural barriers like ocean and mountains. There would be only one human tribe with a single skin color, a single culture, a single language. Without this collision, at a time when technology would have provided mankind on Earth with the technical means to envisage journeys to other stars around which planets carrying organized life would gravitate, they are very far from having overcome their internal conflicts. But this collision between the Earth and this wandering object has revived the activity of the Earth's magma. Convection currents have fragmented the one continent into fragments. It also created powerful mountains barriers. This created 500 different biotopes and led to the birth of plant and animal species 500 times more numerous than standard. On her, 500 different human ethnic groups speaking 500 different languages, have created a multitude of parallel history and different culture. On Earth, if some ethnic groups live in the rhythm of modern times, elsewhere other ethnic groups are in the equivalent of the Middle Ages or even prehistory. Each ethnic group sees other ethnic groups as foreigners. They have adopted different antagonistic religions. The Earth remains the site of many bloody conflicts. While in some country, West is king, in other, vast group of men, women, and children suffer from hunger.
why our technology should today be centered on developing techniques to envisage contact with ethnic groups on other planets who are accumulating totally monstrous weapons. Several times in the recent history, our planet has come very close to the outbreak of nuclear war. Letters from the Yumo network have warned us on this on several occasions, many years after what the proof that these events were indeed so serious. During the last decades, the flow of documents has been greatly reduced. All that remains on Earth are groups of humans who plasmodize text. Such behavior is reminiscent of the cargo cult discovered after the Second World War in the Pacific Islands. The humor text of the 60s suggested that the phenomenon of fragmentation and continental drift would be a rare phenomenon. This immediately led me to examine the case of other telluric planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. It is not necessary to have water in a liquid state to see that continental drift is occurring. The separation of two continental masses cause a break in the Earth's crust and a rise of the magma, which creates a mid-oceanic ridge. This ridge is very visible in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and continues in the form of a fault crossing Iceland. Even if the water in the Atlantic Ocean would evaporate, this scar, which is very visible, would indicate that the continental masses are moving away. But there is no evidence of this sort of thing on Mercury, Venus and Mars. Seismicity, deriving from convection current of magma, is much weaker than on the Earth. It is logical to imagine that planets with a very different biotope have different evolutionary patterns in their living world as well. Let's look at the evolutionary pattern suggested in the Humo papers. The major event suggested is the discovery of the existence of a world that complements the planetary biosphere. We will use the word noosphere, the word nos in Greek meaning soul. Cosmic evolution, as described by the people of Humo, is a co-evolution between the biosphere and its corresponding planetary noosphere, which steers it. In such a scheme, all living beings would then be behaving as the eyes and the ears of this planetary noosphere. After a long period centered on a neo-Darwinian biological evolution, men would occupy a central position as an important communicator with respect to the noosphere. If we give credence to what is present in these texts and to the existence of this planet, its inhabitants would communicate daily in a conscious manner with their noosphere by practicing every day for several hours the equivalent of that on earth we call meditation. The importance of such mental activity for them would exceed any other form of physical activity. This activity is so central. In fact, it is their only reason for living so much that as they grow older and lose the ability to exercise it, their lives seem to have become useless. So they would end it by being euthanized. For them, death would represent a natural phenomenon. In fact, the true purpose of life representing a fusion with the planetary noosphere. We shall assume that the functioning of living beings would be similar everywhere in the universe, so that the Earth would have also its own noosphere. 
let us note that this brings a form of answer to the essential metaphysical questioning, whereas the answer of science, whose only God is God of chance, is limited to denying the existence of soul and post-mortem becoming. If the biosphere of the earth, as suggested in the text, would be 500 times richer than the standard biospheres of the other planets, then its noosphere should have the same level of diversity. It should thus be totally different and much richer and complex than the noosphere of other planets. The result would be that today, in our noosphere, islands associated to 500 different human islands would function as organized system of different beliefs. Obviously, each group is convinced that they hold a truth coded in different religion, customs, and cultures. Scientists constitute a particular group that chooses to deny the existence of a noosphere by adopting a generalized mechanistic vision. Now, let's have a look at how we imagine through our science fiction novels and films the organization and behavior of extraterrestrial civilization. We immediately project images of our own structures, histories, and conflicts. As a general rule, when we think about organized extraterrestrial life, we either imagine things that are totally surreal, or we are hopelessly unable to imagine that ethnic groups physically close to us could function with model patterns, norms, and social structure fairly different from our own. In the end, these visitors are still perceived as a threat. There are a very large number of texts that are descriptions of lifestyles, social structure, and way of thinking that would exist on other planets. The singularity of the text emanating from the Yumo network is that they contain exploitable scientific information. There are also a lot of comments about the contact with the planet Earth. Whether the events reported are real or not, it's a psychological framework that is interesting to analyze. If we were in the same situation, discovering other worlds, we might think that we would tend to analyze and interpret what we would be confronted with by starting to compare it to our own patterns on all levels. Moreover, what would not fit in our analytical sieve, we might perhaps simply not perceive, or we would consider it with a great skepticism. The confinement of soap in its own pattern may not be exclusive to the human race. Extraterrestrials arriving on Earth might tend to project their own interpretation of reality onto everything they see. This is very apparent in the humor text where the authors constantly refer to their own beliefs. There is no thinking without beliefs. Every thought whatever it may be, religious or scientific, is always an organized system of beliefs. According to the Yumo network texts, when these expeditionaries arrived on Earth, they would have analyzed our Earth organization by essentially comparing it to their own. On the metaphysical level, they would have only looked for the system closest to their own, I mean the Christian religion, all other religions being classified as complete illusions. In the same way, all paranormal phenomena were classified either as illusions or as mystification. The idea of a possible reincarnation as well as the existence of past lives were rejected 
simply because it was in contradiction with their own way of seeing things. I think it was a huge mistake. More recent texts from this network show that this view would have remained unchanged in more than half a century. In fact, this whole variety of beliefs is simply a reflection of the complexity and exuberance of the Earth's noosphere. This is both its richness and its drama, because its fragmentation of the human species into such different ethnic groups make it impossible to unite them into a single people. With the appearance and development of weapons of mass destruction, this situation poses a terrible danger to the human population. This misunderstanding of our humanity extends to many planes. To attribute the lack of artistical pictorial activity to the early development of the photographic techniques is an evidence of a fundamental misunderstanding of artistic expression. The same observation can be made when we read texts comparing their other concerts to an artistic activity, whereas such activity is closer to cooking. It is likely that many of the species that visit us must search in our musical expression some mathematical theorems while remaining perfectly insensitive to these strange organized sounds. This text, always factual, scientifically oriented, comparable to computer listings, are totally free of metaphors, fantasy, image, and emotional content. Chances are that words like poetry, literature, and humor would be totally incomprehensible to our visitors as it is likely that the ethnic groups who visit us are nectalopes, one can even think architectural beauty remains a foreign concept for them as well. There is no reference to the unconscious or even simply to dreaming in these thousands of pages, which seems to indicate that this kind of visitors may also have escaped them completely. Even the examination of the psychology of individuals is left to the computer. Basing on a detailed examination of the synaptic connection in the human brains. Finally, there is a very important aspect. If the number of expeditionaries has remained so small over years, as the text say, the process of acquiring data about the planets involves the use of a very powerful artificial intelligence. There is a lot of literature that talks about how the extraterrestrial society would be organized. Only the texts from the human network provide argued and precise descriptions. This society, at the end of a turbulent history, would have evolved by entrusting a generalized and permanent control of individual and collective behaviors to powerful artificial intelligence built on the basic of founding principle. Such an artificial intelligence would be based on general ideas about the desired totalitarian mode of society, but founded on real principles of peace, justice, and equality among individuals. In addition, strict autogenetic control based on advanced knowledge in the field would guide procreation with a view of optimizing the species at all levels. Whether these texts are authentic or not, they provide a fairly logical scenario of what could be a strategy of contact between an extraterrestrial ethnic group and planet Earth. Upon arrival 
on Earth, the main task of the expeditionaries would be to install everywhere systems to capture information in all forms, including genetic information. This could explain the sperm samples. It would be left to the computer to put this mass of data into order. It is indeed conceivable that extraterrestrial expeditionaries could entrust their artificial intelligence with the task of evaluating the psychological profiles of Earthlings. This could have led to numerous errors of appreciation of the possible behavior of individuals. Back to these techniques of crowd control and formatting the individuals, we have to realize that these already exist in an embryonic way on Earth and on the scale of a much larger project on planetary scale. The alleged aim is to reduce the level of turbulence in our societies and to stabilize them. But these techniques are immediately diverted to groups that have no interest to in creating justice and equity. On the contrary, there are the expression of a choice to keep large human masses in slavery under the control of a world government in the hands of an oligarchy. At the same time, inequality and instability, instead of being reduced, are increasing. As a conclusion to this video dedicated to the Yumo case, what can we say about the recent messages received in the form of tweets? Until now, sophisticated scientific content had served as indicator that the messages, at the very least, came from the same source, whatever the source could be. Today, these tweets are free of such contents. The message delivered is invariably focused on the prediction of future significant disorders within a relatively short period of time. Considering the current events, anyone could say that the opposite would be surprising. Individual guidance is then given on the measures to be taken to survive this period. It is also suggested to try to influence the Earth noosphere through collective meditation sessions. Assuming that this meditation directly inspired from the Yomo scheme could be effective, they would act only on a small portion of the Earth noosphere to which the participants belong, which would cast a doubt on their effectiveness. At no time do the authors seem to envisage a significant fragmentation of the Earth's North sphere, image of its turbulent biosphere and social sphere. What remains for us extremely surprising is the fact that these visitors did not immediately begin to take control of our planet, reducing us to slavery which we would inevitably do if we could come into contact with an extraterrestrial civilization technically inferior to us. This may be related to the special situation of the Earth, which, because its exceptional biodiversity, could be considered as a zoo, as a natural reserve. Without the need of a report from extraterrestrial visitors, any inhabitant of the Earth can understand we are heading towards a relatively near future, one of the most dramatic. The word apocalypse is not so strong to describe it. But the word apocalypse has a double meaning of catastrophe and revelation. What should we understand so essential so that this rendezvous will not be so damaging to our history? This question, which concerns us above all, will be the subject of a future video based on another exotic information.